Hello students, we are going to talk about pectoral region today. The competency which we have to cover is that you must be able to describe the attachments, nerve supply and action of pectoralis major and pectoralis minor muscle. The learning objectives which we have to cover in this session are that by the end of this lecture, all of you must be able to define the boundaries of pectoral region. You must be able to show the surface landmarks present over this region. You must be able to define what do we mean by mid clavicular plane, which is also present over the pectoral region. You must be able to explain the extent, attachments and continuation of pectoral fascia and clavipectoral fascia, which are nothing but the deep fascia present over the pectoral region. You must be able to identify and describe the site of attachment, nerve supply and actions of the muscles present in pectoral region. In this lecture, we will learn about the anatomical structures by proceeding from superficial to deep. We know that in the body, the most superficial structure is the skin, deeper to which we have got superficial fascia. For the deep, we have got deep fascia. Deep fascia encloses the muscles present deep to, the, deep to it. And in the last, we will see the clinically significant conditions related to the anatomical structures present in the pectoral region. While talking about the skin over the pectoral region, we will learn about the dermatomes. Uh, in superficial fascia, we will talk about the contents of superficial fascia. In deep fascia, we will learn about pectoral fascia and clavipectoral fascia. In muscles, we will learn about the sites of origin, insertion, nerve supply and action of the muscle. So with this background, let us see the extent of pectoral region. The word pectoral comes from a Latin word which is pectus which means chest. The illustration on the left shows trunk, this is trunk. The trunk is divided into upper part which is called as thorax and the lower part which is called as abdomen. The pink rectangle here indicates the location of pectoral region. Now, in order to see the boundaries of pectoral region, you need to focus on the illustration present on the right side. Pectoral region, posteriorly, it is bounded by upper six ribs and medially, it is bounded by a bone called as sternum. This is sternum. Laterally, pectoral region is bounded by a pyramid-shaped space called as axilla. This represents the location of axilla. And superiorly, pectoral region is bounded by a bone called as clavicle. Inferiorly, it is continuous with the anterior abdominal wall. Now, students, we will see the surface landmarks. These are the list of surface landmarks in the pectoral region. And you all are expected to locate these landmarks in the human body. The list include clavicle, suprasternal notch, sternal angle of Lewis, infraclavicular fossa, coracoid process, nipple of memory gland, you must be able to draw a line called as mid-clavicular line. In the illustration on the screen, you can see these red arrow indicates clavicle. You can see that clavicle is visible and palpable throughout its length. The medial end of the clavicle forms the lateral boundary of a notch called as suprasternal notch. This is a suprasternal notch. Now, this is sternal angle of Lewis. The sternal angle of Lewis, it is actually the junction of manubrium and the body of the sternum. It is clinically important because certain changes occur at this level. Now, this fossa which you can see just below the clavicle is called as infraclavicular fossa. The infraclavicular fossa is also known as delto-pectoral triangle. It is located inferior to the clavicle in between the clavicular head of pectoralis major muscle and anterior fibers of the deltoid. In future sessions, you will read about these two muscles and then you will be better familiar with the term infraclavicular fossa where it is exactly located. 
the tip of the coracoid process lies approximately 2.5 cm below the clavicle and lateral to this fossa that is infraclavicular fossa. The tip of the coracoid process it is covered by the anterior fibers of the deltoid. This represents the nipple of memory gland. The nipple of the memory gland ideally is located in fourth intercostal space. However, it varies from person to person depending upon the gender, depending upon the obesity level. Now students, this illustration is to show you how to draw the mid clavicular line. This is the medial end of the clavicle and this is the lateral end of the clavicle. If we draw an imaginary line connecting these two ends of clavicle, then this is the line. A vertical line passing through the midpoint of this previously drawn line, such that this vertical line bisects the previous line. This vertical line is called as midclavicular line. Now the question arises, why are we talking about midclavicular line? Because in future when you will study the thorax and the abdomen then this mid clavicular line will be used as the reference plane for drawing the line of pleural reflection to localize the apex beat and to divide the abdomen into nine quadrants so with this we end up the landmark and now let us start the cutaneous nerve supply over the pectoral region the cutaneous nerve supply over the pectoral region is taken care by ventral rami of T2 to T6 spinal nerves. In the illustration on the right, you can see the anterior cutaneous branch of T2, T3, T4, T5 and T6 spinal nerve along with the lateral cutaneous branch of T3, T, T4, T5 and T6 spinal nerve which provides the sensory nerve supply to the skin over the pectoral region. Now the question arises, why the lateral cutaneous branch of T2 is not included in the cutaneous nerve supply over the pectoral region? Because the lateral cutaneous branch of second thoracic spinal nerve, which we, call, which we are right now calling as T2 spinal nerve, Instead of supplying the lateral part of the pectoral region, it enters the upper limb and provide nerve supply to the floor of the axilla and upper part of the medial part of the arm. Along with this, supraclavicular nerve which has a root value C3 and C4 also provide cutaneous nerve supply to the upper part of the pectoral region. The red arrow indicates the lateral cutaneous branch of second thoracic spinal nerve which is called as intercostobrachial nerve. The illustration on the left let us focus over that. The red arrow indicates the plane above which the cutaneous nerve supply is provided by supraclavicular nerve which has the root value C3, C4 and below which the cutaneous innervation is provided by thoracic spinal nerves. So this plane can also be called as interdermatomal plane because above this cervical spinal nerves are taking care of cutaneous innervation and below this thoracic spinal nerves are uh, providing the cutaneous innervation. This interdermatomal plane it passes through sternal angle of Lewis. Also the question arises the ventral rami of c5 c6 c7 and t1 spinal nerve why are they not providing cutaneous innervation to the pectoral region the answer to this lies in the fact that during embryonic life with the growth of the limb bud the upper limb bud these c5 to t1 spinal nerve they enter the upper limb bud and they are then responsible to provide motor and sensory nerve supply to the upper limb rather pectoral region and hence they are deficient in the figure on the left side. The illustration on the right side shows the course of a typical thoracic spinal nerve. The aim of placing this illustration is to make you understand the meaning of anterior and lateral cutaneous nerve. Where are these nerves coming from? So let us see the illustration on the right side. 
From the spinal cord, multiple rootlets come out and unite to form roots of a spinal nerve. So here you can see that this represents the ventral root of a spinal nerve and this represents the dorsal root of a spinal nerve. Both the roots will unite to form a single spinal nerve. The spinal nerve will then divide into two divisions or the two branches which are called as anterior ramus this is anterior ramus and posterior ramus of a spinal nerve the posterior ramus will proceed uh, behind that is on the posterior side of the thoracic wall that is back and the scapular region and will provide motor and sensory nerve supply there however the anterior ramus will wind round the thoracic wall and will come on the anterior side now let us trace the anterior ramus this is the anterior ramus the anterior ramus in the area of mid axillary line will divide into two terminal branches they are anterior and the lateral branch so this is the anterior branch which will continue ahead as anterior cutaneous nerve and this is the lateral branch which will then pierce the overlying structures uh, which are intercostal muscles, superficial fascia and then will divide into anterior and the posterior branch and will take care of the cutaneous innervation over the pectoral lateral part of the pectoral region. So this is lateral cutaneous nerve. So with this you are aware from where exactly the anterior and the cutaneous uh, nerve which innervate pectoral region comes from. Now let us start with the superficial fascia present over the pectoral region. The superficial fascia over the pectoral region consists of two important structures. They are one is the muscle which is called as platysma. This is platysma and another structure is the mammaric gland. Now let us briefly talk about platysma. Platysma is a muscle which is present in the superficial fascia. It takes origin from the subcutaneous tissue present over the infraclavicular and subclavicular region. Hence, it occupies the upper part of the pectoral region and because it is partially present in the pectoral region, hence it was important to mention the name here. The details of the muscle will be taught to you in when you will be studying head and neck. Let us now start with the deep fascia present over the pectoral region. The deep fascia over the pectoral region is called as pectoral fascia. Let us now see the illustration present on the right side of the screen. Here, this is the left side of the cadaver and this is right side of the cadaver. On the left side, you can see the muscle fibers present. These are the muscle fibers of pectoralis major muscle, which is the most superficial muscle over, present over the pectoral region. On the right side, you are not able to see the muscle fibers because here the deep fascia, that is pectoral fascia, is yet intact. It has not been removed. So you can see how pectoral fascia covers the pectoralis major muscle. It extends superiorly till the clavicle where it fuses with the clavicle. Inferiorly, it becomes continuous with the deep fascia present over the anterior abdominal wall. Medially, the pectoral fascia extend till the lateral border of the sternum and laterally after enclosing the pectoralis major muscle, the pectoral fascia become continuous over the axilla as axillary fascia which forms the floor of axilla. Deep to pectoralis major, another layer of deep fascia exists which is called as clavipectoral fascia. Clavipectoral fascia is the continuation of deep lamina of pectoral fascia. In order to better understand clavipectoral fascia, let us see the illustration on the screen. Here, this illustration shows that if we take a parasagittal section through the pectoral region, then the structures which we can appreciate the arrangement of the structure will be like this. The same illustration is represented schematically on the right side here. So let us concentrate on this schematic representation. In this representation, this, this is the superficial side that is anterior side and this is the deeper side or posterior side. This represents the clavicle. This is pectoralis major muscle 
covered by pectoral fascia. This green line represents pectoral fascia. Below the clavicle, we can see a muscle attached here. This is subclavius muscle and this is pectoralis minor muscle. So now let us talk about the vertical and the horizontal extent of clavipectoral fascia. Vertically, clavipectoral fascia extends superiorly till the clavicle and inferiorly till the axillary fascia. This is axillary fascia. Axillary fascia is the deep fascia which covers the floor of axilla. This is axilla, that is axillary region, which we commonly call as armpit. So, clavipectoral fascia, we can see superiorly, it is extending till clavicle and inferiorly till axillary fascia. Superiorly, clavipectoral fascia split into two lamina, anterior and posterior lamina. Both the lamina enclose a muscle, which is subclavius muscle. The posterior lamina, which covers the subclavius muscle, posteriorly continues upward in the neck as investing layer of deep cervical fascia. Both the lamina at inferior border of subclavius unite together to form a single layer, which again split at the superior border of pectoralis minor muscle into two lamina, anterior and posterior lamina. Both the lamina covers the pectoralis minor muscle reunites to form a single layer which is called as suspensory ligament of axilla. It is so named because it pulls up the uh, floor of axilla upward in order to maintain the concavity of the axilla. Now, in this illustration, we can conclude that clavipectoral fascia encloses two muscle, superiorly subclavius and inferiorly pectoralis minor muscle. Let us now trace the clavipectoral fascia horizontally. In order to trace the clavipectoral fascia horizontally, let us concentrate on the illustration present on the screen. Before going ahead, let us identify the structures. This is clavicle. At the medial end of the clavicle, we have got menubrium sterni and this is body of sternum. This represents first costal cartilage. To the first costal cartilage and the first rib, a muscle is attached, this which is subclavius muscle. In between the clavicle and the first costal cartilage, you can see this green color structure which represents a ligament and because this ligament extends in between the costal cartilage and the clavicle, hence this ligament is named as costoclavicular ligament. This is menubrium, this is body of sternum, so this is sternal angle of Lewis. At the level of sternal angle, you can see this costal cartilage, which is second costal cartilage, and this is second rib. In between first costal cartilage and first rib, and second costal cartilage and second rib, you can see this brown color structure, which is external intercostal muscle, and this green color structure is external intercostal membrane. So, Proceeding laterally la uh, towards the lateral end of the clavicle, we can see this process which is acromial process of scapula. This represents coracoid process of scapula. In between the coracoid process of scapula and the clavicle, you can see this green color structure which represents a ligament which is named as coracoclavicular ligament. Now, this is another ligament which extends from coracoid process till acromial process and hence this ligament is named as coracoacromial ligament. This is pectoralis minor muscle. With this information, let us trace the clavipectoral fascia horizontally. Clavipectoral fascia encloses the subclavius muscle and pectoralis minor muscle. After enclosing these muscles, the clavipectoral fascia when traced medially, it extends till the costoclavicular ligament, first costal cartilage and the fascia covering the external intercostal membrane and external intercostal muscle. And then the fascia, the clavipectoral fascia, fuses with these three structures, costoclavicular ligament, first costal cartilage and fascia covering the external intercostal muscle and membrane. Laterally, the clavipectoral pectoral fascia extend till the coracoid process, till the coracoclavicular ligament and till the coracoacromial ligament. 
and then fuses with these three structures. The superior border of clavipectoral fascia sometimes become thick and it extend this thick part extend from coracoid uh, process laterally till the first costal cartilage. This thickened part of clavipectoral fascia will then be known as costocoracoid ligament. Now let us learn the structures which pierce the clavipectoral fascia. In the illustration here, we know that this is subclavius muscle, this is pectoralis minor muscle. Both these muscles are enclosed by clavipectoral fascia. In between these two muscles, you can see this green color structure. This is clavipectoral fascia and you can very well see the three structures which are piercing the clavipectoral fascia here. Let us now label these structures. This blue color structure represents a vein which is named as cephalic vein. Cephalic vein drains the venous blood from the upper limb and pierces the clavipectoral fascia in order to drain its venous blood into underlying greater vein which is subclavius vein. This red color structure represents the thoracoacromial artery. Thoracoacromial artery, you can see the pectoral branch of thoracoacromial artery after piercing the clavipectoral fascia comes in superficial relation to pectoralis minor muscle. The third structure is this yellow color structure which is lateral pectoral nerve. This lateral pectoral nerve comes from lateral cord of brachial plexus. After piercing the clavipectoral fascia, this nerve innervates the pectoralis minor muscle and comes in superficial relation to the pectoralis minor muscle. Um, along with these three structures, one more structure pierces the clavipectoral fascia. The, uh, it is lymphatics. The lymphatics which drain the upper limb and the pectoral region pierce the clavipectoral fascia in order to drain their lymph into the underlying lymph nodes which are present deep to clavipectoral fascia. These lymph nodes will be called as infraclavicular group of lymph nodes. So let us summarize which all are the structures which pierce the clavipectoral fascia. We have thoracoacromial artery, lateral pectoral nerve, cephalic vein and lymphatics. Muscles of the pectoral region. There are four muscles present in the pectoral region. From superficial to deep they are pectoralis major, deeper to which we have subclavius and pectoralis minor. Amongst these two, as we can see in the illustration on the right side, this is pectoralis major. If we remove the pectoralis major, then deeper to it, we get two muscles. Uh, the superiorly lying muscle, this is subclavius and inferior to it, we have a triangular muscle which is pectoralis minor and the fourth muscle which is present deepest is the serratus anterior. Let us first start with pectoralis major. Pectoralis major, it is a thick triangular muscle as you can see in the illustration. This is pectoralis major which is the most superficial muscle present in the pectoral region. This muscle it has got wide site of origin and towards the base which is at the upper end of the humerus the muscle narrows down and hence the profile is triangular. This pectoralis major it forms the anterior wall of axilla and the lower border of pectoralis major forms the anterior fold of axilla. On the basis of site of origin three heads are defined in pectoralis major muscle. They are clavicular head, sternocostal head and eponeurotic head. The fibers from the clavicular head originate from the anterior surface of the medial half of the clavicle and adjoining part of superior and inferior surface of the clavicle. The fibers from the sternocostal head arises from the anterior half of the width of menubrium and body of the sternum till sixth coastal cartilage and the fibers also take origin from adjoining part of the coastal cartilages. The eponeurotic head also called as rectus head arises from the eponeurosis of external oblique muscle.
Now, in the illustration present on the right side of the screen, you can see the site of origin of pectoralis major muscle. This is the site of origin of sternocostal head and this is the site of origin of clavicular head. Below here is the site of origin of aponeurotic head of pectoralis major. Here, this is the upper end of the humerus. Here you can see this represents the site of insertion of pectoralis major muscle over the lateral lip of bicipital root. Now, in order to better understand this, let us focus on the illustration present on the left side of the screen. This is the upper end of the humerus. This is the head of the humerus, lesser tubercle, greater tubercle, and in between the lesser and the greater tubercle, we have a groove present which is known as intertubercular sulcus. Now this intertubercular sulcus, it is bounded by two walls. Laterally, the wall is called as lateral wall or the lateral lip of intertubercular sulcus and medially it is bounded by the medial wall or medial lip of intertubercular sulcus. Over the lateral wall of intertubercular sulcus, the fibers of pectoralis major muscle insert, which is well seen in the illustration on the right side. So, this blue line represents the site of insertion of pectoralis major muscle, which is exactly the lateral lip of bicipital groove, which is also called as intertubercular sulcus. The fibers of pectoralis major muscle after taking origin from such a wide area, all the fibers converge laterally to form a flat bilaminar tendon. Now what do we mean by the term bilaminar here? Bilaminar tendon means the tendon consists of two layers, anterior and posterior layer. The anterior lamina or the anterior layer, it is thicker compared to the posterior lamina or the posterior layer. The anterior lamina, the fibers of the anterior lamina are placed superficial to the posterior lamina. Now, let us talk about the individual lamina. Anterior lamina, which is thicker and superficially placed, is made up of fibers from clavicular head and sternal head till fifth costal cartilage. In the anterior lamina itself, the fibers are arranged from superficial to deep. We have superficial most we have clavicular head then followed by the fibers coming from the menobrium sterni followed by the fibers coming from the body of the sternum till fifth the costal cartilage so the anterior lamina is superficial talking about the posterior lamina the posterior lamina is thinner it is formed by the fibers coming from the body of the sternum at the level of sixth costal cartilage sixth costal cartilage and from the aponeurosis of external oblique muscle. The posterior lamina is thinner and placed in the deeper plane compared to the anterior lamina. Now, this slide is to show you the characteristic pattern of insertion of pectoralis major muscle. Let us first see the illustration present on the right side of the screen. Here you can see that this is the bilaminar tendon of pectoralis major which is attached to the lateral lip of intertubercular sulcus or the lateral wall of intertubercular sulcus. Here you can see that this is anterior lamina and this is posterior lamina. Now what you need to appreciate that anterior lamina it is thicker placed anterior and at a lower level at in the intertubercular sulcus compared to the posterior lamina which is thinner and placed posterior and reaches at a higher level compared to the anterior lamina. Now let us see the illustration on the left side of the screen. Here you need to appreciate that the fibers forming the posterior lamina we know that the fibers of the sternocostal head at the level of sixth costal cartilage and aponeurotic head forms the posterior lamina. Now, you need to appreciate that in the posterior lamina, the aponeurotic head and the sternal fibers curve round the fibers located above them. Hence, these fibers which are lowest in origin, but they are attached at the highest point at their site of insertion. Now, let us 
study about the structures related to pectoralis major muscle. The structures in superficial relation to the muscles are the superficial, uh, superficial most we have got skin followed by superficial fascia which consists of mammary gland, cutaneous nerves and vessels and a muscle named as platysma. The muscle itself is enclosed by a layer of deep fascia called as pectoral fascia. In order to understand the deeper relation of pectoralis major, let us see the illustration on the right side. In this illustration, the pectoralis major, you can see the cut edges of pectoralis major muscle. It has been excised in order to expose the underlying structures. Immediately deep to pectoralis major, we have a muscle named as pectoralis minor, which, are, which has also been incised and retracted. For the deeper, we have got ribs and in between ribs, we have got external intercostal muscle and this muscle which is called as serratus anterior. Superiorly, just below the clavicle and in between clavicle and the first rib, we have a small triangular muscle which is named as subclavius muscle. The illustration, this, uh, this is a schematic representation in order to show how pectoralis major muscle lies superficial and deep to it we have got subclavius and pectoralis minor muscle. So we can summarize that the structures present in deeper relation to pectoralis major are pectoralis minor, ribs, external intercostal muscles, serratus anterior, and subclavius muscle. Superior border of pectoralis major muscle is separated from the anterior fibers of deltoid by deltopectoral groove. In order to understand this, let us see the illustration present on the right upper corner. In this illustration, these are the fibers of pectoralis major muscle and this represents the superior border of pectoralis major. These are the fibers of deltoid and specifically they are anterior fibers of deltoid. They take origin from the clavicle. Now here you can see a groove present between the anterior fibers of deltoid and superior border of pectoralis major. This groove is called as deltopectoral groove. It is also called as deltopectoral triangle because this groove is triangular in profile with the apex directed downward and the base is formed by the clavicle. Now, we need to know which all are the structures which pass through this groove and which all are the structures present in the floor of this groove. So here in this illustration, you can see this blue color structure. This structure is cephalic vein. Cephalic vein, after draining the venous blood from the upper limb, enters the deltopectoral groove and then take a 90 degree turn to dip down in order to pierce the clavipectoral fascia so as to drain the venous blood into the axillary vein. You can better understand this by seeing this illustration. In this illustration, the clavicular head of pectoralis major muscle has been incised and reflected in order to show you the underlying structures. Here, this white color structure is the clavipectoral fascia. This blue color structure is the cephalic vein. So you can see how cephalic vein ascends in the arm and then enter the deltopectoral groove, take a turn and then dip down in order to pierce the clavipectoral fascia and finally drain the venous blood into the underlying greater vein which is axillary vein. The other structure present in the deltopectoral groove is this red color structure which represents the deltoid branch of thoracoacromial artery. The next structure present in the deltopectoral groove is the lymphatic. The lymphatics present in the deltopectoral groove, they drain the lymph from the upper limb and the pectoral region and finally enters the deltopectoral groove to drain their lymph into the underlying group of lymph node which are called as infraclavicular group of lymph node. Now let us talk about the structures which are present in the floor of deltopectoral groove. Deltopectoral groove, the floor of deltopectoral groove has got a muscle called as subclavius. Subclavius 
is enclosed by clavipectoral fascia as we can see in this illustration this is subclavius muscle and the green line represents the clavipectoral fascia so this is the level of deltopectoral group so in order to summarize the structures which pass through the deltopectoral groove are cephalic vein deltoid branch of thoracoacromial artery and lymphatics which finally drain the lymph into infraclavicular group of lymph node the structure present in the floor of deltopectoral groove is subclavius muscle enclosed in clavipectoral fascia the nerve supply to pectoralis major muscle comes from medial pectoral nerve and lateral pectoral nerve in the illustration on the right side you can see this is pectoralis major muscle the clavicular head has been reflected from the a uh, clavicle in order to show you the underlying structures here you can see this is clavipectoral fascia which is being pierced by lateral pectoral nerve so lateral pectoral nerve which comes from the lateral cord of brachial plexus innervates pectoralis major muscle from its deeper aspect The illustration here on the right side is a schematic representation of the sagittal section of pectoral region if this is the superficial side and this is the deeper side this is clavicle and this is pectoralis major muscle so here this represents the lateral cord of the brachial plexus and this represents the medial cord of brachial plexus from the lateral cord of brachial plexus a branch called as lateral pectoral nerve comes and innervate the pectoralis major muscle from its deeper aspect on its way the lateral pectoral nerve it is seen to pierce the layer of the fascia which is clavipectoral fascia on the other side this is the medial cord and from the medial cord a branch comes which is medial pectoral nerve which pierces the pectoralis minor muscle innervates the muscle and then approaches the pectoralis major muscle from the deeper aspect in order to innervate the pectoralis major muscle so this is how pector, uh, the medial and the lateral pectoral nerve approach the pectoralis major muscle in order to provide the nerve supply to the muscle so we now know that pectoralis major is a muscle fibers of which take origin from bone in the pectoral region the muscle fiber cross the shoulder joint anteriorly to get attached to the upper end of the humerus hence this muscle will contract to bring about movement at shoulder joint when all the three heads of pectoralis major muscle contract they result in adduction and medial rotation at shoulder joint this can be well understood by seeing the short video clips on the right this is abduction at shoulder joint and now this is adduction at shoulder joint this adduction at shoulder joint is brought about by contraction of all the three heads of pectoralis major muscle so in this video you can see adduction is occurring in coronal plane in the other video you can see adduction occurring in transverse plane both the uh, in both the planes adduction is brought about by contraction of all the three heads of pectoralis major muscle the other function of uh, pectoralis major is medial rotation at shoulder joint so in this video clip you can see how medial rotation of the arm or i may say medial rotation at shoulder joint is occurring because of the contraction of all the three heads of pectoralis major muscle the third function of pectoralis major muscle is to bring about flexion at shoulder joint that is to move the arm forward and medially this occurs when clavicular head of pectoralis major muscle contracts and this action is brought about in conjunction with the anterior fibers of deltoid and coracobrachialis in all these three movements that is adduction medial rotation and flexion at shoulder joint brought about by pectoralis major the site of insertion moves and site of origin remain constant that is fixed however 
in the next two movements which we are now going to study the site of insertion will remain constant that is immobile whereas site of origin will move so let us see the other two movements the sternocostal head of pectoralis major muscle may paradoxically result in extension at shoulder joint now how is this possible when the arms are fixed in situations like climbing a tree or performing pull up exercises what is done is by holding the rod or the branch of the tree we uh, the person makes the insertion site fixed that is immobile then by pulling up the trunk the site of origin is actually moved upward this occur in conjunction with two other muscles uh, latissimus dorsi and teres major muscle and also the posterior fibers of deltoid this is a very good example of reversal of action phenomena uh, as we can see in the short video clip here the person has is holding a rod by holding the rod the site of insertion at the upper end of the humerus is made fixed and now he is pulling up the trunk upward that is the origin of pectoralis major is being pulled upward now this action is brought about by contraction of sternocostal head of pectoralis major muscle the other function of pectoralis major muscle is to assist in forceful inspiration during this movement also the insertion is made fixed whereas the origin moves that is uh, during deep inspiration the cos the ribs they move whereas the site of insertion is made fixed these two movements are very good example of reversal of action phenomena deeper to pectoralis major muscle we have a muscle called as pectoralis minor the illustration on the right side shows pectoralis minor muscle the fibers of this muscle take origin in the form of three slips the slip arises from third fourth and fifth rib exactly from the external surface and superior border of the third fourth and fifth rib few of the fibers also arises from the intervening fascia present over the external intercostal muscle over present in between these three ribs the fibers after taking origin they proceed superolaterally and then they form a tendon which insert over the medial border and superior surface of coracoid process coracoid process which is a process present over the scapula now this illustration is to show you Uh, the site of origin of pectoralis minor muscle again so we can see if we see, count the ribs from above to downward then this is the first rib at the level of sternal angle we have second rib this is the third rib fourth rib and fifth rib so from the external surface and the superior border of third fourth and fifth rib and intervening fascia in the intercostal space in between third fourth and fifth rib are the site of origin of pectoralis minor muscle the muscle then the muscle fibers then converge and form a tendon which insert over the coracoid process present over the scapula exactly over the medial border and superior surface of this process which is coracoid process now let us see the structures related to pectoralis minor muscle we will first see the structures related superficial to the muscle let us focus on the illustration present on the right side here it has been shown that if we take a parasagittal section passing through the pectoral region then we can see the structures placed in the body like this here we can see that this is clavicle these are the fibers of pectoralis major deeper to which we can see pectoralis minor muscle here we can see pectoralis minor is covered by clavipectoral fascia and pectoralis major muscle covered by pectoral fascia so this illustration shows that pector uh, one of the structure related superficial to pectoralis minor muscle is pectoralis major the other two structures which are in superficial relation to pectoralis minor are 
lateral pectoral nerve and pectoral branch of thoracoacromial artery. This illustration shows the other two structures related superficially to the pectoralis minor muscle. Here we can see that this is pectoralis minor muscle. This is pectoral branch of thoracoacromial artery and this represents the lateral pectoral nerve which comes from lateral cord of brachial plexus. We can see these two structures along with the subclavian uh, cephalic vein they are seen to pierce a fascia called as clavipectoral fascia. So these are the structures which pierce the clavipectoral fascia and then they come in superficial relation to pectoralis minor muscle. The structures in posterior relation to the muscle are ribs, external intercostal muscle, serratus anterior, axillary vessels which means axillary artery and axillary vein, brachial plexus and lymphatic. So let us see these structures in the illustration on the right side. Here this is pectoralis minor muscle which has been incised and then reflected in order to show the underlying structures. Here we can see this is a rib, this is the other rib and in between edges and rib, we can see these muscle fibers. These are the fibers of external intercostal muscles. This muscle which we can see is serratus anterior. So this illustration shows three structures which lie deeper to pectoralis minor. They are ribs, external intercostal muscle and serratus anterior. This illustration is to show you the axillary vessels, how they are related posteriorly to pectoralis minor. This is pectoralis minor muscle. This is axillary artery and the blue color structure is the axillary vein. Parallel to axillary artery, we have got brachial plexus. Now, after seeing the superficial and the deep relations of pectoralis minor muscle, let us see the structure related with the superior border and inferior border of pectoralis minor muscle. Let us see the illustration present on the right side. If this is the superior border of pectoralis minor and this is the inferior border of pectoralis minor, then the inferior border of pectoralis minor, it is related with the artery named as lateral thoracic artery along with which we have lateral thoracic vein. The superior border of pectoralis minor is related with superior thoracic artery which you can see here. The superior thoracic artery will descend down over the pectoral region and will then come in relation with the superior border of pectoralis minor muscle. Now let us see the illustration present on the left side of the screen. Here we can see that this is the uh, this is the inferior border of the muscle and parallel to the inferior border of the muscle we have got lateral thoracic vein as we just talked that uh, the inferior border of the muscle is related with the lateral thoracic artery and vein parallel to the lateral thoracic vein we have got a set uh, or a group of lymph nodes axillary lymph node which are called as anterior group of axillary lymph node. So please note the inferior border of pectoralis minor is related with the anterior group of axillary lymph node which can also be called as pectoral nodes or pectoral lymph node. Superior border of the pectoralis minor it is related with the thora uh, superior thoracic artery and it is also related with the apical group of lymph nodes, which you can see here. The nerve supply to pectoralis minor muscle comes from medial pectoral nerve and lateral pectoral nerve. Both these nerves are the branch of brachial plexus. So in order to understand how these two nerve innervate the muscle, let us see the schematic representation. In this representation, this represents the lateral cord of brachial plexus. One of the branch of lateral cord of brachial plexus is lateral pectoral nerve. So this represents the lateral pectoral nerve. The lateral pectoral nerve after it pierces the 
clavipectoral fascia. This is clavipectoral fascia. After the nerve pierces the clavipectoral fascia, it gives a branch which innervates the pectoralis minor muscle. This is pectoralis minor and this is pectoralis major. So, it gives a branch to innervate the pectoralis minor muscle and then the nerve further proceed towards the pectoralis major muscle and innervate the muscle. If in this illustration, this represents the medial cord of brachial plexus. One of the branch of medial cord of brachial plexus is medial pectoral nerve. So this represents the medial pectoral nerve. The medial pectoral nerve passes superficial and then it pierces the pectoralis minor muscle and innervates the muscle and then it goes further superficial towards the pectoralis major muscle and finally ends by providing nerve supply to pectoralis major muscle. Coming to the actions of pectoralis minor muscle, the muscle contracts to bring about protraction of scapula. How do we define protraction of scapula? The protraction of scapula is defined as the movement in which the median border of scapula move apart, that is move away from each other, such that the scapula rotates around the chest wall forward. So, pectoralis minor muscle along with the serratus anterior muscle brings about protraction of scapula. Now, let us see the protraction of scapula in the video on the right. Here you can see that because of the contraction of the muscle, the medial border of scapula are moving apart. So this was a protraction brought about by serratus anterior and pectoralis minor muscle. The other action of pectoralis minor is that when the muscle contracts, the highest point of scapula, which is formed by acromial process, is pulled downward. So let us see this in the video clip on the right. Here you can see that the muscle is contracting to bring the highest point of scapula downward. Protraction along with this movement occur simultaneously as you can see there. The third function is the muscle assists in forceful inspiration just like pectoralis major muscle. Pectoralis minor is also a accessory muscle of respiration. So let us see this. In this video clip, you can see that how the rib cage is moving up because of the contraction of pectoralis minor muscle. Now, again, in this action, the site of insertion is made fixed and site of origin is moving. So, again, this is an example of phenomena of reversal of action. The next muscle is serratus anterior. This muscle takes origin from the outer surface and superior border of upper eight ribs and intervening fascia covering the external intercostal muscle. This can be well understood by seeing the illustration on the right side. You can see that these are the digitations in the form of which the muscle takes origin from the upper eight ribs, exactly from the outer surface and superior border of the upper eight ribs. After taking origin, these digitations, they combine together to form a flat sheet which passes posteriorly around the thoracic wall and insert over the costal surface of the medial border of scapula, which is represented by this blue line. Talking about the insertion, serratus anterior has got a characteristic way of insertion. The First digitation, that is the fibers which arises from the first rib, they insert over the superior angle of scapula. The next two to three digitation insert over the costal surface of entire medial border of scapula. And the last four to five digitation collectively insert over the costal surface of inferior angle of scapula. This can be well understood by seeing the illustration on the screen. On the left side, dorsal surface of scapula is shown and on the right side of the screen, ventral surface of the scapula is shown. At this point of time, we are concerned with the ventral surface which is costal surface of the scapula. The blue 
arrow here represents the site of insertion of first digitation of serratus anterior which is at the superior angle of scapula the next two to three digitation insert over the remaining part of the medial border of the scapula so this arrow represents the uh, site of insertion of next two to three digitations of serratus anterior this arrow represents the site of insertion of lower four to five digitations of serratus anterior that is the costal surface of the inferior angle of scapula talking about the nerve supply this muscle is innervated by long thoracic nerve long thoracic nerve comes from the root of the brachial plexus it has the root value c5 c6 and c7 it is also known as nerve of bell the long thoracic nerve after taking origin enter into the axilla by passing through the axillary inlet and then it descend downward by lying superficial to serratus anterior and just deep to skin and superficial fascia in short the nerve is very superficially placed over the medial wall of axilla this represent the serratus anterior the digitations of serratus anterior and this arrow represents the yellow color structure which is long thoracic nerve so you can see that long thoracic nerve is placed superficial to serratus anterior muscle talking about the action of serratus anterior this muscle act as a prime agonist for protraction of scapula now what do we mean by protraction of scapula protraction of scapula is the movement of scapula in which medial border of scapula moves apart that is move away from each other or move away from the midline and when does protraction occurs whenever we try to push something or do punching movement at that time protraction of scapula occurs you can better understand protraction of scapula by seeing the clip on the right here you can see that because of the contraction of the muscle medial border of scapula is moving away from the midline this is called as protraction of scapula and you can see that the person on the left side is pushing a table ahead right now while performing push up movements that is pushing the floor while in the prone position protraction of scapula occurs so you can see how beautifully the medial border of the two scapulae are moving apart the next function of serratus anterior is that it facilitates the lateral rotation of scapula now what do we mean by lateral rotation of scapula lateral rotation of scapula is the movement in which the inferior angle of scapula moves laterally as a result glenoid cavity faces upward and when does lateral rotation of scapula occurs whenever abduction at shoulder joint is performed this movement the abduction at shoulder joint is accompanied by lateral rotation of the scapula you can better understand this by seeing the video clip on the right you can see uh, the abduction at shoulder joint is occurring and simultaneously the inferior angle of scapula is moving laterally and glenoid cavity is facing upward this is lateral rotation of scapula performed by the lower four to five digitations of serratus anterior which insert over the inferior angle of scapula because of the contraction of serratus anterior the medial border of the scapula and the inferior angle are pulled anteriorly as a result the costal surface of the scapula remain opposed to the thoracic wall so this is the other function of serratus anterior muscle the next muscle in the pectoral region is subclavius subclavius it is a long triangular muscle which takes origin from the superior surface of the junction of first rib with its costal cartilage the origin is tendinous after taking origin the muscle fibers ascend superolaterally 
towards the inferior surface of middle one third of the clavicle where we have a groove which is the site of insertion of subclavius muscle. If this represents the first rib uh, and this represents the clavicle then this is the site of origin of subclavius and this is the site of insertion of subclavius muscle. We can uh, view the site of insertion over the clavicle in the illustration present on the screen. The upper illustration represents the superior surface of clavicle whereas the lower ins uh, illustration represents the inferior view of the clavicle. Now we are concerned with the inferior view of clavicle where we can see a groove represented by the blue arrow. So this groove which is present in the middle one third of the inferior surface of clavicle is the site of insertion of subclavius muscle. Subclavius derives its nerve supply from nerve to subclavius which has the root value C5 and C6. This nerve is the branch of upper trunk of brachial plexus. Subclavius muscle, it pulls the tip of shoulder inferiorly. It, pull, it also pulls the clavicle medially in order to stabilize the sternoclavicular joint. The muscle resists accelerated elevation and rotation of scapula during the abduction movement that is elevation of the shoulder girdle during the abduction at shoulder joint. Now let us see the structures related to subclavius posteriorly that is the structures present deep to subclavius muscle. We need to focus on the illustration present on the right here. The middle one third of the clavicle has been excised in order to show the underlying structures. So this blue arrow represents the cut edges of subclavius muscle. This is subclavius and let us now see what all are the structures located deep to this muscle. We can see this is subclavian vein, this is subclavian artery and this is brachial plexus. So subclavian artery, subclavian vein and brachial plexus lie deep to subclavius muscle and hence this muscle protect these three structures from undue trauma. So this is another role of subclavius muscle in the body. Now let us start with the clinically significant conditions related to pectoral region. Students, we talked about pectoralis major muscle. This muscle may sometimes be absent congenitally. Whenever this occurs, it has been seen that commonly sternocostal head of pectoralis major muscle is deficient. However, this condition is extremely rare. Whenever this occurs, then the patient does not have any muscle to form the anterior axillary wall and anterior axillary fold. As a result, the anterior axillary fold is, con is formed only by skin and pectoral fascia. Sometimes pectoralis major is absent along with pectoralis minor muscle. Whenever both these muscles are absent, this condition is called as Poland syndrome. In Poland syndrome, associated hypoplasia of memory gland has been seen. The next very important condition is winging of scapula. So let us see the details of winging of scapula. Winging of scapula. Why is this disorder so named? Because in this condition, because of the paralysis of serratus anterior muscle, which normally helps in protraction of scapula. Also, it pulls the medial border of scapula anteriorly to keep it opposed to the thoracic cage. And due to paralysis of this muscle, during pushing and punching movements, anterior pull on the medial border weakens. As a result, posterior pull exerted by the muscles like rhomboids which attach to the dorsal surface of the medial border predominates. Hence, the medial border protrude posteriorly. So, it looks as if the patient has wings on his back. As you can see in the illustration on the screen, here the patient is pushing the wall. As a result, the medial border of his right scapula has become prominent. So, with this background, let us see uh, uh, the details of winging of scapula. Winging of scapula occurs because of the injury to long thoracic nerve. 
and why does this occur because we know that long thoracic nerve uh, is placed superficial to serratus anterior muscle and just deep to skin and superficial fascia over the medial wall of the axilla and because of the superficially placement of this nerve in the body this nerve becomes prone to injury so what are the clinical presentation of the patient with injury to long thoracic nerve as uh, because of which paralysis to serratus anterior occur medial border of the scapula of these patients moves posteriorly that is away from the thoracic cage giving the appearance of wing and when does this occur whenever an attempt is made to push or punch as a result uh, uh, the patient is uh, not able to perform this as a result the medial border becomes prominent also in same patient overhead abduction is difficult because in overhead abduction lateral rotation of the scapula occurs and this lateral rotation of scapula is facilitated by lower 4 to 5 digitations of serratus anterior which insert over the costal surface of the inferior angle of scapula because of the paralysis of the muscle lateral rotation will will fail to occur as a result the patient also has additionally failure to perform overhead abduction so this was all about the clinically significant condition related to pectoral region with this we end up today's session thank you